Good evening, good evening, Sishiro Community Church. It is another wonderful day, another great opportunity to study this God's Word together. We are continuing in our study with looking through what Jesus was preaching when he was on the Mount of Galilee many, many years ago. Today, we arrive finally at Matthew chapter 7, we're going to look at the first six verses. We're going to look at the first six verses. Now, for those of you who have not been with us, please remember that the Sermon on the Mount spans through three chapters. It starts in chapter 5 of Matthew, and then it goes to chapter 6. We just finished chapter 6 last week, and from now going forward, we will be in the last chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew chapter 7. Now, there are certain things I want you to be aware of if you are not with us or if you missed some of the sessions. Just a quick recap. What, it, what the Sermon on the Mount is, is, is divided into three parts. Now, the first part, which is chapter 5, it's all about the theoretical understanding of who God is. The correct understanding and interpretation of the spirit or the attitude of the law from God. That is all in chapter 5. And then in chapter 6, it's all about now that you know who God is, and what the law means by what it says. Chapter 6 is all about the application, the practical implementation of that which is being taught in chapter 5. And we've seen how to rightly practice the spiritual deeds or the spiritual worship to God as opposed to hypocritical worship based on the true worship. And then, now in chapter 7, what we're going to look at is you understand the law of God, you understand who God is, and you understand salvation. And then in chapter 6, you understand what you ought to do and how to do it in order to worship God. And then in chapter 7 is now your relationship with other people. How should you relate to others? So chapter 5 was vertical, and then chapter 7 is horizontal relationships. Before I go too much into what we are going to talk about, let, let me rather read, please open your Bible to Matthew chapter 7, where we are going to read the first six verses for today. The first six verses of Matthew chapter 7. That's where we are and that's where you and I should be. Let's read it and then we will pray and then we will delve into it together. Now in Matthew chapter 7 from verse 1 to 6 it reads like this. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye. You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before swines of pigs, 
lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. That is the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we come to your throne of grace and we thank you for this great opportunity to come together to study it, to understand it. Help us, Lord, not to, not to end there, but help us to go and be doers of your word in our private daily lives before our public lifestyles. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, let's dissect this together. Here's what we are going to learn. There are six imperatives that we will pick up from this text. The first two are instructions. And then number three and four, those are the questions. And then number five and six are the concluding points of this text of Matthew chapter 7 from verse 1 to 6. Now, because this is a Bible study, it's not comprehensive. What, we, what I'm going to do here is to urge you to put some interest in you so that you go on studying this on your own, in your Bible. There's going to be a lot of references, but then again, let's go again is going to be two instructions, number one and two, and then there's going to be two questions, rhetorical questions, and then finally, the, there will be two concluding points of the text. Let's go and look at those. Let's start with the instructions from our Lord and Savior. Now, here's the background. You will not understand this if you don't see where this is coming from. Now, where this is coming from is Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, as we ended in chapter 6. He was correcting the behaviors that are not godly, that are not biblically correct, that are trending as if they are correct. And Jesus is exposing their phoniness or their fakeness or their hypocrisy. And then, the biggest hypocritical behavior that is being exposed is self-righteousness. Now, self-righteousness is when a person believes that by doing certain things, he is immune to certain rules and regulations. He believes that he is right with God when he is not. That is the downside of self-righteousness. Now, where we are, Jesus is starting with the relationship that those that claim to be righteous to self are actually not. Because what self-righteousness does is it makes you heartless, merciless, because your focus is on applying the law rather than having or developing a relationship with those that you engage with when it comes to matters of faith. There is no mercy. There is no grace in the law because with the law comes judgment, not mercy, not grace. But when Christ comes, he came with truth and grace. Do you see this? But the law came with judgment and with the knowledge of sin. But you and I cannot in and of ourselves do anything to defeat the sin that dwells or entangles us from within. We are helpless. We are useless. We are hopeless on our own when it comes to fighting sin. But 
Jesus here is addressing a group of people during that time who were harsh, who were the religious elite. I'm putting inverted commas because they were not. Let's delve into it. Two instructions. Number one, judge not. Now, many people in Matthew chapter 7 verse 1, they quote this when you are trying to correct them. When you are trying to show them that that which they are doing is wrong. And then they quote this and say, no, 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 no. Judge not. Don't judge me. That's a misapplication of this instruction. Because it is Jesus who said, beware of the false prophets. How are you going to be aware if you are not judging which one is right, which one is wrong? How, how, how are you going to be aware? So Jesus is instructing us to judge righteously. You'll see that as we are going along. But the kind of judgment Jesus is against is the harsh, censorious, and that, that is arbitrary, and that is judgmentally harsh, where you judge someone thinking that you don't need the judgment because we are all going to be judged. If you come with humility, and you judge every situation biblically, but not emotionally from the intentional attitude of self-righteousness, thinking that you are better than the person you are judging, then you would be judging proper. But mostly, the judgment that Jesus is talking about, he says there, judge not, do not, the judge not, the first instruction is, do not be harsh. In your judgment. So that you also cannot be harshly judged. No one must write off the life of someone. If someone is a drunkard today, you have no right, you and I have no right to declare that person eternally bankrupt and eternally condemned. Because you would be usurping God if you try to do that, you'd be behaving as if you are God. Because only God knows the end from the beginning. He declares the end from the beginning. Judge not. Don't finalize a life of someone. Don't look down on those that are down today. Those that are not wise today, don't look down on them. If you do that, then you are on the extreme side towards legalism. Because what the Pharisees in this time were doing, they were saying we follow the law of Moses only. And when you follow the law, the problem is the law brings judgment, but does not bring mercy and grace. And then that's why he says, judge not so that you be not judged. Because if you are not harsh at other people, knowing that you also are capable of sinning and you also have your own sins, then that means you have humility and you believe in Christ who already took the penalty for your sin, your future sins and your current sins. And then you will not be judged. Do you see the, the mystery behind this text? Let's go to John chapter 7 verse 24. And, and, and I want you to see something here. In John chapter 7, look at verse 24. In verse 24, it says there, Do not judge by appearance, but judge with right judgment. We can go deeper into describing what the right judgment is, but we don't have time for that. 
I urge you to continue searching that. I need to move on to the second instruction. Let's read together. Matthew chapter 7 verse 2. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, this concept is taken from Abom, Aboni Bezek. Aboni Bezek is a character who is a king in Judges. In fact, let's just read the first seven verses of Judges chapter 1. And you're going to learn something here. Very interesting. It's paramount. I can go to others, but I want to remain with Aboni Bezek. Now, Aboni Bezek, let's read it and about him. The first seven verses of Judges chapter 1. Listen to what it says there. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites? Right? Joshua is dead. They don't know what's going to happen. To fight against them, the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. Right? Listen carefully. Follow, follow uh, with me. We are in Judges chapter 1. We are reading the first seven verses. Now we are in verse 3. Listen to this. And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, Come up with me into the territory allotted to me, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I likewise will go with you into the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went with him. Then Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek. Right? Now listen to what happened. Verse 5. They found Adoni Bezek at Bezek and fought against him and defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Listen to what they did in verse 6 of Judges chapter 1. Adoni Bezek fled, but they pursued him and caught him. And what did they do after they caught him? Listen to verse 6. And they cut off his thumbs and his big toes. Listen to verse 7 carefully. And Adoni Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table. That, that was how harsh he was at other kings that he defeated and he cut their thumbs and their big toes. And listen to the second part of verse 7 of Judges chapter 1. As I have done to them, so God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. Do you see this? So the same way that Aboni Bezek cut the thumbs and the big toes of the kings that he defeated. When Jerusalem defeated him, they did the same thing to him. So go, let's go back to Judges, to Matthew chapter 7, verse 2. For with the judgment that you pronounce, you will be judged like that. And with the measure you use, the same measure... If you're harsh, the same measure will be used against you. Do you see these two instructions? Be careful. Whenever you are in a position to judge someone, to discern if someone is right or wrong, don't be harsh. And the best way not to be harsh, here's my advice. Use God's word. Not your own experience, not your own knowledge, not your own feelings. Not your emotions at that time, but use God's word and you won't be harsh. You become harsh in judging others when you do it with your own feelings and from the flesh. But if you do it with God's word, then you will be doing it from the spirit of God. 
and from the spirit of humility. Let's continue. We are now going to the two questions that Jesus was asking. These are rhetorical questions. That means they are questions that are actually statements. They don't need you to answer them. Before we read these questions, I'm going to describe what a log is. A log ketatana tata. A log is that is a plank, a big one. And then a speck is a splinter. You know that little thing that goes into your skin? That a speck, it's a splinter. Very important to understand those two differences. This is a very small thing. Listen to this. Verse 3. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Do you get this? Now, Jesus is saying, you are busy judging people. But when you have your own log, and these people have specks, they have splinters, they have little things in their eyes. But when you go around with a big log in your eye, a plank that is in your eye. And what is that plank? Remember, he's talking to people who are generally self righteous because they follow the law of Moses. They think because they follow the law, they are right with God. Now, the log is self righteous He says, you don't see this self righteousness Because self righteousness says, I'm right with God. I don't need a savior. I don't need Jesus. I don't need his sacrifice. I don't need his salvation. I don't need his mercy. Because by me doing that which is written in the law, I'm right with God. That is the attitude of a person who is self righteous And that is a log that is referred to in Matthew chapter 7 verse 3. It's a rhetorical question because if you have a plank in your eye, it's impossible for you to see a splinter or a piece, a little piece of wood in the eye of the next person. So which means it's impossible to see that which is a splinter. All these things are sins. Rhetorical question number two. Here's question number two. Verse 4, he continues, another question. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? Okay, here's the difference. In the first rhetorical question is about whether you can see with the log. And then in the next question, is whether you are able to take it out if you can't see it. Do you see this? So, which means you and I, you have to be aware of your own shortcomings, your own sin, because we all, we all have sin. If you claim not to have sin, you are a self-righteous liar. And lying to yourself. And you are insulting God. Who said in Romans chapter 3. There is no one righteous. Not even one. And you are declaring that God is lying. Be careful. Be aware. Acknowledge your own sin. And deal with it. See it. And take it out. Before you can go and correct others. The concluding remarks. Number five and six. Listen to this. Hypocrisy is pretending that you don't have sin when you do. Because we all have it. That's hypocrisy. He says, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Which means, 
we all need to care for one another. We need to confront each other when we sin. We have to do that. However, before you confront another person, deal with your own sin. Deal with the elephant in the room. Deal with yourself. Let the word of God deal with you before you share it with others. Otherwise, you'll be a hypocrite. If when all you do is prepare a message for others. That's hypocrisy. Because God's word is not meant for people other than yourself. It's meant for you. When you are reading it, it's yours. It's your word. And it's for you to action. Now, here's the main point. Let's continue reading. The main point of the message is you must deal humbly with your own sin. Be humble about your own sins. You are not perfect. And I'm not. Let's deal with our own sin. Number one. Number two. If we deal with our own sin, we will be able to help others with their sin as well. Because judgment is for God. I'm going to read two portions of scripture on this issue before we move on to verse 6. In Romans chapter 14 and chapter 2, we're reading the first eight verses in Romans chapter 2. And then we'll read verse 4 until verse 10 in Romans chapter 14. Listen carefully to this. I'm not going to interpret it a lot because our time is already uh, running out. Now, let's start. Romans chapter, we're starting with Romans chapter 2. And in Romans chapter 2, I want us to read the first eight verses about judgment. Listen to this. Therefore, you have no excuse. You and I have no excuse, O oh man. Every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. Why? Because... You, the judge, practice the very same things that you are judging others on. Why? Because we are sinners as well. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things, and yet you do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance, not to judging others? God's kindness and mercy, forbearance, patience, kindness is meant for us to repent. It's not meant for us to go and judge other people. But because of your hard and impertinent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Do you see this? Judging others brings judgment on yourself. Listen to verse 6 to 8. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience in well-doing seek the, for the glory and honor and he will give eternal life. Right? But for those who are self-seeking. Those are the self-righteous. Self-seeking for their own glory. And they do not obey the truth. But they obey unrighteousness. There will be wrath and fury. There will be retribution and distress. Do you see that? Be careful. This is serious stuff. That's Romans chapter 2, the first eight <coughs> verses. Read with me in chapter 14. You're going to read from verse 4 to 10. In Romans chapter 14, from verse 4 to verse 10. That's the main point. Listen to what Apostle Paul was saying when he was writing to the Roman believers. From verse 4. He says there, Who are you? Who are you? To pass judgment on the servant 
of another. Remember, people who worship God are servants of God. Like you are a servant of God. So don't pass judgment on somebody who's not your servant. They belong to God. It is before his own master that he stands or falls. So let's not judge one another harshly. Because we are not masters to each other. We are all servants to God. And he will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. He is empowering those who believe in him. So don't judge them harshly. Be humble and kind. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Very important. Each one should be fully convinced, which means this speaks of conviction. Now, if a person is convinced that a, one day is holier than another, leave that person alone. He's serving God. Don't judge him. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. And the one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord. Since he gives thanks to who? Not to you, but to God. While the one who abstains from Kuluve, for example, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. So don't judge that person. For none of us lives to himself. No, we don't live for ourselves. And none of us will die to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to who? To the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Now listen to this question. Now, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother for practicing certain things? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. All of us. That is why you and I have no right in judging the next person. Let's go to verse 6 and then we close. Verse 6 says, Don't give dogs what is holy and don't throw your pearls before pigs because they will trample them underfoot and they will turn to attack you. Why is this here? The point of this text of verse 6 of Matthew chapter 7 is that you need to respect that which is holy. Holy, remember, it means it's set apart for God. So respect that which is holy and don't waste it by sharing it with those who insult and reject Salvation from God in Christ Jesus. Now, who are the dogs? Who are those pigs? Let's go to Revelations. And then you'll see what, what those pigs and dogs are. In Revelation chapter 3, listen to verse 14 and verse 15. Revelation chapter 3, from verse 14... No, what am I saying? Revelation chapter 22 from verse 14 and 15. <laughs> Revelation chapter 22. We are reading verse 14 and verse 15. It says there, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life. Right? And that they may enter the city by the gates. Verse 15. Outside the city. Who's outside? Are the dogs? What are those dogs? Sorcerers, baloi, witches and wizards. Sorcerers, which is born out of jealousy, right? Not being excited for somebody's success. That's sorcery. 
And then, the sexually immoral, bagidi febe, those who are in sexual promiscuous relationships that are not in the confines of marriage, the biblical definition of marriage, which is between a female and a male committed forever until death do them apart. If they have any sexual activity outside of marriage, is sexual immorality, and that makes you a dog. And then, murderers. Murderers is not only those who are killing people, but murderers are those with the hateful intention. If you hate someone, you are as good as a murderer, and that makes you a dog. And then finally, idolaters. Idolaters are people who worship anything other than God. If you worship anything, money, prestige, fame, gold, cows, elephants, any animal, statues, if you worship anything other than the true God, which is Jesus Christ, our God and Savior, then you are an idolater. You are an idol worshiper. And that makes you a dog. I pray that if you were worshiping those things, if you were committing sexual sin, having sex, and you are not married, I pray that you repent today. Because the day of Christ's coming is not on anybody's calendar. We don't know when he's coming. Rather, repent today. It is my biggest prayer, and our biggest prayer in Seshawo Community Church, that please, as a truth pillar, you need to repent today. Not tomorrow, because we don't know what's going to happen. There are other texts that I wanted to read. But time is not on my side. On this issue, let's preserve this message. Don't share the truth of scripture, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to people who insult salvation. Because it's like giving pearls to a pig. So let's not do that. And then, read Proverbs chapter 9, verse 7 and 8 on your own. You'll realize that when you engage in sober discussions with a fool, you end up looking like a fool yourself. And remember, a fool is a person who does not fear God. So, on your own, please read Proverbs chapter 9 from verse 7 and 8. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 9, and Philippians Chapter 3, from verse 2 until verse 3. Because that's the definition of Gentiles. May God richly bless you. And may you repent. And please stop self righteous judgment on other people. When you judge, judge rightly according to God's word. Don't judge according to emotion. Don't judge according to your own level of knowledge. Don't rely on your own understanding, but rely on God's word to judge, to discern between right and wrong. Let's close with a prayer. Papa, we come to your throne of grace and we thank you for your word today. Help us to repent completely from hatred, jealousy, from sexual immorality, from idolatry, all these things you hate them and they make us dogs that will remain outside your kingdom. May you please have mercy on us. We are listening to you every Tuesday. Help us, Lord. Empower our spirits and our hearts to believe in you completely. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.